Welcome to week eight. It is the discussion about images and text, and it's on. So, just a quick reminder that over the course of the case study and applied slides, your task is to take your understanding of marketing theory that we covered in the first six weeks and find places to make use of it alongside the places that I also describe how it could be in use. And here's a couple of prompts and cues as to the areas that might be of interest to you. So, on image and text, how can you use it in your project? Most people should be using image and text as just a given aspect. If you're doing video on YouTube, then you've got the thumbnail. It's a single frame, it's an image, it's on. You've got the description of the video the caption and that's the same for Instagram you've got the caption text is an ever-present part and if you're using a platform like Twitter it's still capable of hosting GIF still capable of hosting GIF files and hosting images now in terms of customer co-creation value image is a big area text even bigger throughout this course a lot of the material that is being presented to you in the outside of video context is in writing. So text is a major part of how you are creating value. Also, you're going to write three assignments for me and you're going to use a text-based forum and you're using the Padlet. So, you, you know, kind of important. But also, images are a thing that you can make use of in the ePortfolio. So let's dive in, get started. Uh, now, there are a lot of different file types around images. Here's a bunch of the common ones. I am old and I make mistakes. And one of those is that it is pronounced GIF now. The creator came out and said that the file, uh, file name is GIF. And that's it. We, we don't get to argue on that front. It doesn't matter what the letters are. It matters what the creator said. And the creator said it's GIF. Therefore, that's what we're going to run with. I will still make mistakes over time, but this is how it is. Uh, bitmap files. Jeez, these things are large, ugly, and old school. Uh, JPEGs, mostly the th file format of choice for when you're dealing with photos. Uh, GIFs are the file format of choice for animation or very low bandwidth uh, still frame. PNG is good for transparency. In fact, this little wrapper I've got on the screen here is a transparent PNG file. Oh lordy, TIFF files. Uh, for when you need high resolution and ridiculous overkill, I say this as someone who creates TIFF files. Uh, back in my previous life, I was a layout artist for a student union newspaper. And in the days when we were still talking about hard drives in terms of one gig being more than you'd ever need, I ended up creating a 16 meg TIFF file that was high resolution for print for an A3 page. The poor little machine that was working on it was state of the art and it groaned. You could hear the drives move when it was uh, being worked on. So we've improved technology. PSD files, uh, Photoshop, proprietary Photoshop file format. Huge number of those on my hard drive because all the time the university is paying for my Photoshop subscription, I'm gonna use it. And the last item on the list here, Give it up, Apple. You got MP4. You moved all of us from MP3s to MP4. You do not get another file type. The HEIF is a file type that shows up on your iPhone if you don't go into the settings and get it to calm the hell down. The thing about the HEIF file format is it's proprietary and therefore it's very difficult to edit in non-Apple things including Photoshop, which, stupid call, Apple. Stupid call. All right, hex codes. Uh, I'm going to point this out to you on the way past. The internet is made of code and text, and one of the ways to represent color is through hex codes. Hex codes are particularly useful if you need, to, when you're creating a style guide and a style manual, to be able to exactly put the information in. You also see the RGB, uh, that is screen. The good rule of thumb is hex codes for when it's web-based, 
RGB for when it's screen based and CMYK for when it's going to be printed out but as its primary purpose. Cyan, yellow, magenta, black, CMYK. If we can deal with CMYK, we can deal with GIF as a file format. Other very important thing to understand now, it is the 21st century, there are bad operatives, bad faith operatives, and there are problems with the fact that our mobile devices, on the one hand, are super useful for their capacity to capture enormous amounts of data. And I frequently use the metadata in my photos to find them because I can go, I took a photo that I want to use and I remember the place and I will use one of the photo tools that I have to search through my image library's metadata by geolocation. The downside to this is that if you have taken a series of photos with a smart device, the geolocation of those photos is embedded within the file format. So you may give away things that you didn't want to give away, like your home address or where you were or who was with you. So some of that basically, uh, it's 21st century digital housekeeping, digital data things. You need to know how to scrub metadata. You need to know how to remove it from video. You need to know how to remove it from audio and still frame because this is how the world is. It is a shame, but reality beats idealism nine times out of ten, and on the tenth time, idealism and reality tend to draw. That data, the metadata is useful for me internally, in-house, to be able to do file augmentation and find things, but scrub it. And again, a lot of the files you'll see from me go through Photoshop, so there's a layer of file scrubbing before it hits reality. All right, the other thing that we need to uh, work out here is when we're talking about co-creation value and images, it's a complex and many faceted beast. Uh, on the front line, front level is, did you create the photo for yourself or for an audience? Are you using it as part of another thing? Now, throughout this course, you will see a number of images that are built for the course. Uh, every week opens with one or of one of my photos modified into being used. So it is a pro assumption. I was on location, I took photos, I go back through my archive library going, oh, I'll use this one, I'll use that one, that fits the color scheme. So it is pro assumption. I will take photos for Instagram. I take photos for myself to have a library of images, sometimes for reference, but sometimes it's a case of, I'll see a thing, grab a photo, five years later I'll be like, hey, now I've got a use for that. So it doesn't have to be immediate reciprocity, it can be long term. But also, this straight up, you can take photos for yourself because you want the memories, or they are memory augmentation. Now let's talk price and images. From a consumption side, there's a bunch of, if you're paying money for photos, that's quite good. Uh, the Envato, uh, Shutterstock, and a whole bunch of other, uh, clip art's the wrong word, stock art uh, repositories and libraries allow you to pay money in exchange for high quality photos across a range of different topics and ideas. And we've got some citation of that in the examples. The other place is if you're using a an image hosting site like Imager, uh, there are a few others, but they they tend to go broke periodically or get bought out and the venture capitalists who buy them forget that the purpose for which people find value in an image hosting site is the image being hosted so you can put it somewhere else. And if you come in and then proceed to say, oh, we'll just break all the links to images on the internet, that's not a value addition. That doesn't up the, up the price. But the other thing on pricing uh, is that the free, freemium and premiums are usually about, when you're looking at it from a host perspective, it's about capacity, how many files can you store. Uh, Flickr, which is an online hosting service, you pay a premium to host more photos. 
anyone can view your photos depending on the settings you've used and you basically provide content to Flickr for Flickr to be a useful viable library of content but you also then pay for the bandwidth, um, the storage space on the server. Now the rationale here is that there is a third way in which you can gain value and that is by having these images available you are able to share them and make them shareable and therefore if you're someone like me who contributes photos to the open source um, to the Creative Commons license because I've used a lot of Creative Commons art in my time I can give back to my community. I give that out for free in return, I pay a subscription to enable it to be made available because it has been a benefit to me to make these images publicly shareable. Trust, commitment, reciprocity. I trust that people will use Creative Commons appropriately and with the appropriate attribution. The commitment is I provide the art, they provide the backlink, and the reciprocity is that over time, it we get this mutual circle of benefits flowing. My work gets recognized and things that I saw and thought, oh, that's interesting. Took a photo off and uploaded, that gets to move around the internet and help people out who needed a stuff. One of my, the ones that gets commonly used is a photo I took in Canberra of a poster, mostly torn poster, asking if you were ready for the zombie apocalypse. Gets quite a lot of work in October. Non-financial price considerations, things to consider. The time, effort, and learning curve is a really interesting one. Anyone can take a photo. It takes real skill to take a really bad photo, but equally it takes real skill to take a very, very good photo. And things like photo editing, photo manipulation. Photoshop is an ugly bastard of a package and it's not intuitive. It's just that I happen to have been using it since 93, so with nearly 30 years match practice, I'm okay at it. But I'd like to point out is 30 years of using it at least multiple times a week, I'm okay at it. I'm no, by no means an expert. Huge learning curve. There are sections of that software I just don't go to and don't use. Uh, energy, viewing, low, taking, high. Uh, lifestyle, a bit mixed. And at times, one of the things that has been of amusement to me over time is that I have encountered situations where I've met people who have been very much the, no photos, please, I'm, I'm an actress, I'm an actor. And for the life of me, I can't remember what they look like, nor do I remember them ever being successful. These days, lifestyles and photography is all tied together with how much of your worldview are you presenting and what's the lifestyle price of how you present yourself and as someone who basically has got pretty much an unlimited yet almost maxed out lifestyle card um, I don't care I, I take the photos I want to take I post the photos I want to post and I'm not in it, in it for the likes and the shares I'm in it to go oh that's a terrible pun I can make with that image I'm gonna post that to Instagram all right, let's talk a little bit about platform and right up front, one of the really interesting challenges of the image aspect is the image itself as a displayed item, the thing you look at is one version of the product. The image that you can then save to the hard drive is the second version. And the image that you pay a stupid amount of money for to claim that you have some form of proprietary ownership over is a con and NFTs are stupid. They're a terrible idea of trying to create digital scarcity when the point of digital duplication of images is that they have no scarcity. This is the point of the digital platform. No scarcity of data. NFTs try to introduce scarcity into a medium that doesn't need it. Dumb. Just economically and ecologically, terrible idea. On the other side, there's a little question here. On well, the transfer, transformable, so the convertible intangible and the transportable intangible, is it still the same product? When you print out an image onto a Polaroid, have you created a transformative product and created a new product, or is it still an image? Equally, if you go and 
run off a bunch of photos into a photo book, is it st are they still images or are they now a book? I, I don't have a good answer for that. The last one though, I've mentioned a couple of times, stock art, clip art, the mediator is intangible where you have a license to use a piece of content. Now, for those of you who are doing content based and content derivative work, it is worth getting yourself either very familiar with Creative Commons archives, and there's a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, there's a cartoon, Wondermark, that is entirely built on artwork that has come into the uh, public domain. So it's ancient. It's old black and white line art harvested from a range of books that are now out of copyright. And it's an ongoing um, concern. It's been running for a number of years. And it's very good at what it does. Equally, one of the things that you can do is that you can also contribute back into the stock art, the clip art, and the Creative Commons licensed community. So there are some things to consider here. And I'll mention Flickr again in the case studies. Uh, but it's worth looking at whether if you are into photography and you are good at capturing images and capturing distinct and unique visual concepts, the extent to which you can move into being a provider of content through services like Envato and Vectorstock. All right, let's play with the case studies. First up, yours and my favorite thing, Instagram. It is... Oh, it is getting progressively worse. It was the premier one-stop shop for image sharing. There's a little asterisk footnote on Instagram that's important to understand, is that Instagram started life as a full-fledged social media platform. It had about 15 to 20 different functions on it. Instagram's original owners were going broke because they had stacked on the features without checking if anybody wanted them. Uh, and what happened is that when they looked at their data and their analytics and their metrics, they realized the only thing people cared about on the original photo sharing site was the, so on the original social media sharing site was the photo sharing function. The ability to slap a caption on an image and pass that image around a network of friends. They pivoted, created Instagram from that big bulky mess and had a very distinct take photo, upload photo, maybe apply some filters, put a couple of hashtags on it, share it with the people who are following. And it was succeeded and it worked and it was rivaling, it was causing Facebook some trouble, which is why Facebook bought it. The problem now is Facebook is trying to do more things. It's trying to be a baby TikTok clone. It's trying to be a... So you've got reels, stories, private, direct message, and photos. And recently, Instagram moved the photo creation button into the second tier. So it moved away from its core value offer that the audience wanted and the market liked into something that the manufacturer thought was the most important thing. Also, the Crossways um, integration between Facebook and Instagram is such that you can now toggle a switch so that what you post to Insta gets posted to Facebook. <sighs> when Instagram goes broke, another dedicated photo sharing site will rise up from the ashes. This phoenix is far too valuable in the marketplace. More people really do want to be able to share the happy snaps with their friends, and they want to be able to see a chronologically ordered feed of the people who they are interested in and follow because they're interested in them. That platform will come through and Nike, Instagram, and Facebook a bit later. But also, and another thing, from the perspective of the use of Instagram as a platform, one of the things to consider is the extent to which co-creation and co-creation through the sensory uh, use of photos. So for those of you who are a lifestyle blogger and you have your lifestyle and you show a curated filtered version of yourself to the world and it's followed by many, that curated feed, that life by proxy element is a co-creation. 
the audience is having the vicarious experience. If you are following mostly friends and people who you like, then you are following to have the, what we call in uh, social media, phatic communication, P-H-A-T-I-C. And that is that little social connection, that little connectivity. You don't necessarily have to talk to the person every day who you wave at at the bus stop or greet on the way into the lecture theater, like, hey, hi, how you doing? Uh, little less friends, a little more Instagram, but you have that connection. And Instagram allows us to maintain these sorts of semi-social fanatic connections of soft interaction. We don't have to know depth detail, we don't have to have big verb boast conversations, but we can follow someone on Insta and be like, hey, their cat's really cute, like, oh, that's what their kids are up to these days, like. It is social connection, and so the currency here is social connectivity which does mean that there will be things like parasocial connection to consider. There's a bunch of stuff around consumer behavior uh, and also the purpose for which you follow someone. Do you follow them because you are interested in them as a person or do you follow them because they are an embodiment of a lifestyle that you are trying to pursue? Or do you follow them because they are the broker their Instagram is the brokerage of information that's important to you. And that's why I follow, there are five DJs who I follow because I want to see when their next mix set comes out. And there are six wrestlers who I follow because I want to see who they're wrestling and when they're wrestling so I can go and buy their shows. They are, I follow because they are my catalog. I follow because they are my friends for my friends who I follow. So it's really important to think about how you're consuming an Instagram feed and the multiplicity of co-creation behaviors that this supports. It's not a single, uh, that's the other thing. Be mindful when you're looking at research on Instagram. Uh, the psychology and sociology people tend to pathologize it because sociologists pathologize everything. They have issues, as do the psychology people. Psychologists need to make everything a pathology because that's their core business and their business model, whereas marketers need to make everything a sale because that's our core business model. In the middle is reality, doing its thing. All right, Shutterstock mentioned before that it is a content factory. You can broker your own images in there, so you can create a value in exchange process, and you can create value in use. Going to Shutterstock and randomly downloading files from Shutterstock to save on your hard drive, to do nothing with, waste of your money and their time. Going to Shutterstock because you need a piece of art specifically for purpose, buying it and inserting it into the work you're doing, value and use. So there's very distinct, on the one side you can create content to sell for value and exchange, on the other side you can buy content to apply value and use. Now, Shutterstock is an example of the many, many different places where you can go and broker out and sell your visual content, your images. If you want to go down this path, uh, it's a lot of work, but it can be quite rewarding financially. Also, you end up just getting used to doing the strangest of photography things. And yes, the women laughing at salad is one of the older genres of stock photography. I don't get it myself. Canva. Now, you should be familiar with this. It'd be like your fourth time of encountering it on the process. Canva's here because the university won't spring for everybody to get Adobe uh, Photoshop licenses. Also because Microsoft doesn't have a Photoshop equivalent. This is something that bothers me quite a lot, to be perfect, guys. Of all the niche things, it's not a hill I want to die on, but it is something that is just like PowerPoint, Word, Excel, Outlook, OneNote, Minecraft. There's a whole lot of others as well, but nothing like Photoshop. Uh, and there is, by the way, there was a very, very good Microsoft um, video editor that was bundled in Windows 10, which they've since discontinued. The closest thing is MS Paint, Microsoft Paint, but Paint is not very good uh, compared to the powerhouse that is Photoshop. 
given there are open source alternatives to PowerShop, including PowerShop, Power, open source alternatives to Photoshop, including proprietary online services such as Canva, still don't get it. Still don't see why it's not working. But from Canva, as Canva's the value in use. It is software as service. Its purpose comes from its application. There's not a lot of use in just having a Canva subscription and not doing anything with it. Unless you're a lecturer in e-marketing who needs to be able to. But even then, my um, license is so I can go in there and do stuff and say, hey, Canva, it's useful. Big on co-creation, a lot of stuff around here, around self-expression. Uh, we've talked about its role in branding and its capacity to create brand books. But also from a consumption point of view, if you've been using Canva to make, you're using it for self-expression. And that's a really important part of what it can do is that you can use the custom and the co-creation through custom from menu, uh, through value and use to use the component parts to make something that is meaningful to you. Flickr, which has been mentioned a couple of times early, uh, this is an image hosting site where its purpose is less the embedding of images in other sites and more the development of an online uh, library archive. It's very close to value and ownership. To be quite blunt, I've thrown a lot of files in there over time that I want to have an external backup of these, these items somewhere other than my hard drives and Dropbox. But the value in use here is really interesting is that there are a number of Creative Commons licensed images and there are curated image galleries. There are ways also that if you see an image that you like, you can contact the photographer and seek permission to use it. So if you are looking to embed more distinctive graphical components into your work over time, it's worth keyword searching Flickr. Now, one of your challenges about using Flickr is that you've got to be very good at documentation and archival behavior because when you put a photo up there, you are responsible for tagging it, giving it hashtags, giving it an accurate description, and also scrubbing out the appropriate metadata because it does capture and translate all the available metadata, including photo type and geolocation and details about your device you use to, to take the photo. All right, let's talk a theory and let's talk another thing about, here's one of the things uh, about the world is a lot of people get very angry about influencers because what they're angry about is the breakdown of demarcation. When we look at celebrity and the idea of celebrity as someone who is famous for a reason versus someone who is famous for being famous. Quite often what we overlook is the origin point of the fame. We know this person because we know them, but we forget why we know about them in the first place. Paris Hilton got to be famous in no small part for the fact that she is a Hilton of the Hilton Hotels family. Therefore, the scandal that be of the sex tape that was released was of interest to the world because a rich, super rich person was involved. And that was unusual. So that was the origin point of fame. That Paris Hilton is also an incredibly smart, uh, well-connected and very rich broker who has brought to us a number of other famous people. Uh, and created one of the biggest media empires on the planet in stealth. That is something that we overlook, but we get to, people get very angry at the idea of someone being famous because they didn't earn it or deserve it. You also find concepts of privilege and race and other parts of that come in because who is worthy of being famous becomes a very subjective element. Now, how we explain that subjectivity in marketing language is relatability. 
So there are two facets here that are very important to understand. The concept of Insta famous, Instagram fame. The more relatable someone is, and this comes from celebrity and theory as well. If someone is relatable, as in you can create a parasocial connectivity with them because you can imagine them as part of your life, they have a greater chance of being a strong, credible source of information for you. Why a lot of anger exists is that the insta-famous world exists at a level that the gatekeepers of fame didn't get to influence initially. It's a lot of fame gatekeeping happening. The magazine editors who decided who would be on the front cover didn't get to say who was going to trend in the hashtags and on the Instagram and on YouTube and on Facebook and on Twitter, Tumblr, or the other places. The second thing is source credibility is built upon the platform of social connectivity, which is built upon a platform of parasocial connection. The ease to which you can have a perceived connection and the ease to which you can imagine that a communication from a celebrity is made to you. Jeez, it's hard not to go and exploit that right now. I'm just talking about theory. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about this paper. You're listening because you need to take notes because you need to be using this theory. If you are going to drive your online project around personality, around yourself, then what you are looking to do is to be a source, to have source credibility. There's a whole lot of work done in advertising around source credibility. You want to go embed yourself in that. You want to be incredibly conversant with it. Because source credibility also links back to the capacity to monetize into sponsorship and monetize into word of mouth and monetize into endorsement. Source credibility comes from if you are also seen to have a connection to what's being discussed. Me as the division's tech geek, I have more credibility in e-marketing because I've been there, done that for a whole bunch of it. And I might have done it badly, and I might have done it mediocre, but I've done it. And it's easier then to imagine me being able to go and leave a like on your uh, Instagram page because you've told me it's there and I've gone, hmm, like that. This is where the credibility goes the loop. Strong source credibility comes from the ability to be relatable. Relatable comes from an imagined level of connectivity. The more the connectivity is able to be imagined, the more you think this is a person who'd be part of your life on an ordinary basis, the stronger the relatability becomes, which increases the credibility. It all is a reinforcing cycle that you can work to earn and create. It also means, though, that there will be a whole series of people who dedicate themselves to cutting your credibility down. Now, we see this a lot in uh, video games where angry nerds go out and try and say, well, you don't know anything about the game, you don't really play the game, you're watching playthroughs, or you, maybe you cheat, you use wall hacks, you don't really have the skill. What they're trying to do is they're trying to break the credibility to relatability cycle. They're trying to go and break that so that source of credibility is absent and it reopens that market and that audience for taking by other people. Now, most of these angry nerds believe that they are going to be the person who's going to be followed and worshipped and just they deserve the audience because they showed up that person uh, whilst forgetting that the reason why nobody wants to talk to them is that they're angry nerds who get angry about things nobody cares about. Or, and particularly, they get angry about other people being famous. It doesn't make you a friend. That's not relatable. And that's the thing. It's not relatable. If you want to pick up... The big message out of this paper is that if you want Insta fame, you've got to be relatable. And that varies per market which is why segmentation targeting positioning is so vitally important. I'm an old man who happens to hang around the internet and has been here for a very long time. So I can tell you stories about the old days, 
but also I need to to maintain relatability I gotta actually be doing stuff in the real and doing stuff in the internet in the here and now I've got to be making content and running accounts and running systems in 2022 not just trading on the fact that I was I had a dial-up modem in 93 all right, text and text focus sites. Everything is made of text. The internet is entirely made of text. Binary is text. Machine language is text. Everything is text. It's so nice to have a new Matrix movie out so that my uh, Matrix references get even slightly more refreshed. But basically, everything is text. The internet runs on text, and text is really useful to you. Consequence, though, is that text is not a democratizing force. There are many barriers to text being a strength. Whether you're operating in your third, fourth, or fifth language, whether your language skills are that good, uh, if you're a dyslexic like I am, uh, you run into the problems of you go to write something and the words that are on the screen are not the words that were in your brain. Uh, but that's the thing. I have it why we have every font is trebuchet is trebuchet is a dyslexia friendly font and you occasionally see me make comments in the live events where i'm like oh for god's sake i've got to type live uh, because that is the barrier i work with everything is text and text is massively important on the internet because of the pedigree we started with a very low bandwidth capacity and text is the lowest bandwidth communication tool. The reason why I push you to work the forums so hard is text is also a very robust and versatile tool and it's still difficult. It requires you to practice, it requires you to train, it requires you to rehearse. It is a skill that must be maintained. Just like being a photographer, just like being a videographer, just like being a musician or an athlete. If you're not training and practicing, it gets harder. So text-based engagement is difficult. Accept that and work to it. Just because we post to Facebook on the daily doesn't mean that we are inherently practicing. Same thing goes, by the way, uh, if you are really wanting to push yourself and train nano remo is a really good endurance event but train before you get there it is the national novel writing month it takes place in november uh, also fan fiction uh the archive of our own ao3 i don't have the requisite skill base to write fan fiction and i admire the people who can take a world and craft a world a number of my close friends are were big name fans and big name fan fiction writers in the post Lord of the Rings uh, communities. One of my friends is still maintains a Lord of the Ring community. Of all the places I thought wouldn't be seeing work in 2022, but here we are. The key is words are powerful, and there's a lot of stuff and a lot of places. As much as video is an important part to what I do now. Even the videos accompanied by words. So one of the things about text is that text is co-created. When you read it, you internalize it. And that enables you to imagine, to co-create, to do a whole bunch of the learn, feel, do stuff in the instant of seeing it. Even as I speak to you, it's not as powerful as that when you are reading to yourself. Because I can only do my voice, but if you can, on reading a fanfic, do the voice of the cast in your head, you are doing it right. Alright, let's talk about price. Um, words are everywhere. They are, there are free words, there are paid words, and there are words that are hard to get to without uh, paying someone else money for them. So that's from the consumption side on the production side paying for your words to go to people is called subscription newsletter and there's a half a dozen services for that these days but also advertorials you can pay for other people to write 
about your idea. And you can pay for other people to create your idea in words and put those words into the minds of others. I'd also like to say one of the places that there's a really interesting thing in advertising. Uh, now, I'm a, as you know, I'm a big advocate of product placement. I think it is the untapped solution to many problems. I still maintain that there is room for more product placements in novels and fan fiction. The written word, the Amazon Kindle is a beautiful tool and it has lots of things and it should have more product placement. All right, let's talk um, about non-financial price. To create, there are some very high financial non-financial barriers. Words can take time. It's not always quicker to write something than it is to communicate by video. It's easier for me to sit down and do this 90 minute. Uh, it is literally easier for me to sit down and do a 90 minute video than it is to write a uh, seven and a half thousand word chapter. I know because I've done both. I have written multiple textbooks and I have recorded a lot of video. Video is easier than writing. And video is hard. Second thing is in terms of effort, it's there are varying sliding scales for creation, there are varying sliding scales for consumption. Reading Vargo and Luce 2004 is heavy lifting. Writing Customer Co Creation of Value, Vargo and Luce 2004, is much easier once you've read it, you've embedded it, and you're using it. But the lowest energy thing you can ever do with reading is leave a Leave a thumbs up for your fanfic. Leave a kudos for your fanfic. Uh, if you're reading fanfic, support the author. Give them a thumbs up. Give them a like. Tell them that you love their work. Give them some positive feedback. It matters, it counts, and it's important. And if there's one thing in the ecosystem is that we need to be supporting our fanfic writers where they need it most, and that is at the heart. They need to know that their work, they are loved, they are respected, and their work has brought joy. And that's what you need to be doing if you're out there on AO3, please, take, just pause the video right now, take the moment to go and thank the author of the recent fanfic you read. Then come back and watch the rest. All right, distribution. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff here around. The product is immediately transferable through the distribution, but equally, a digital tangible that can be of value and use. You own the words on a hard drive, but until you read it, it has no value. Believe me, it annoys me more than it annoys you, and I'm pretty sure it annoys you a lot. As someone whose life is based on doing complex tasks and engaging with the written word on a regular basis, geez, I wish it uploaded to your mind when you downloaded the file. It'd be so much easier. So, the last thing on the distribution product aspect of this is for you and your projects, your words can reach an audience and can shape that audience's response. And this is where the hierarchy of effects model comes in. And this is where the whole of the advertising and promotion subject around what is it your words want to achieve? Are your words a call to action or are they an awareness? Do you want them? Do you want the recipient to do something, to feel something, or to think something? Decide upon that, then decide upon the best way you could get this. All right, case studies. Geez, there's a lot of ways you could use words. I'm going to focus on a couple of interest. Uh, first one is Cora. <sighs> Cora has gotten worse. Geez, I wish I wasn't having to say that so often. Uh, it is a text-based conversation discussion, and they've started trying to monetize it, and it's being monetized so badly. It really is being monetized badly. I don't understand how they managed to take a platform that was user-generated questions with user-generated answers and somehow manage to find both their feet with a shotgun barrel. It shouldn't... To start with, it shouldn't be that on a relative scale compared to YouTube, compared to Spotify, it shouldn't be that expensive to run. It should have some premium, premium levels, but locking away our answers that we are creating for free isn't 
the best way. It's just, it, it's one of these things of, I'm looking back at it going, I've used Cora less and less over the years uh, since they put the paywall up because why should I invest my effort in answering someone else's prompt if nobody's going to see what I wrote unless they've paid someone else, not me, $7.50, whatever it is. It's really frustrating. Uh, it's a bad business model they've implemented, but I suspect they've implemented it because they're trying to pare down the amount of traffic on the forums just to people who are doing things that are monetizable. Also, I tend to comment um, a lot about hypothetical scenarios involving zombies because I find it really fun. Not, I'm not expecting a zombie apocalypse, but if we did have one, um, I can tell you now that follow me, I will lead you to the food. Archive of our own. I wish I was better at fanfic. I really do. Life goal of mine is to create a project that has fanfic written about it extensively. I already have one fanfic about a Tumblr post I wrote. Uh, I want, and it was such a joy to have. It was such a, an amazing experience for someone to create an entire story based off a prompt, a fanfic prompt I wrote. You occasionally, by the way, if you're on Tumblr, you will see some of my work float around there. I've written a few things around Space Australians um, humans are space orcs and humans are weird from the alien perspective. So a few of my works are out there. So I've written, I've write fiction in Tumblr, but I haven't written fan fiction as in I haven't picked up a franchise and gone, I am going to take the four characters, lead characters from this and write a story about them running a coffee shop. Also, one of my close friends is responsible for an entire genre inside fan fiction. They were the one who created Winfic. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. What you need to know is the Archive of Our Own is one of the best intellectual property teams on the planet. They've made Disney blink and back down. Archive of Our Own is an incredible achievement in modern society, and it is... Also a place where if you are reading fan fiction, please leave kudos for your authors. Support fanfic writers. Support them. Tell them that they are loved. They are so important to the way that the world can be a better place. All right, I mentioned NaNoWriMo in passing. I'll mention it again in futuring. Um, I've done three NaNoWriMo's in my life. Uh, the trouble for me is that they literally <laughs> November is when my heaviest period of the year of marking takes place. Um, so 30k in 50 days. So 50k words in 30 days. That's how it goes. It's a really great project. Um, you may have to wait until after university, but it's huge fun to just push yourself to punch out those 15, 1400, 1500 words a day. And at the end of it, have a story. Have a story that's yours. Uh, I... If you're into fanfic, good place to do. But also, it's just a really good exercise. Uh, it's a very positive and strong community there and very supportive community of people wanting other people to succeed. All right, near to the end, a couple of last things I want to mention. I mentioned in passing the idea of paying money for other people to read your words. And there are a large number of newsletter service sites uh, button down's the one that's on here. Twitter's got one. There is, uh, well, there are a dozen. Substack has become basically a festering sore on the face of the internet because of the amount of fascists that they have been platforming and giving money to. So don't use Substack. Uh, even if you are, well, just don't use Substack. All right, avoid it. But there are a whole bunch of other places where what you do, you pay your premium to have a better toolkit for writing a newsletter to an audience. The intention of that newsletter is to then generate value, either reputational uh, or offer products or offer services. And it's a relationship marketing tool. It's a long-term game of building trust with an audience who may Enough members of that audience will give you money for services later. 
down the track to make the initial investment of time and effort worthwhile. I actually think that this is an area that we haven't fully explored as a product. It's very strongly in promotion, but I think as a product, standalone product, it has a future that we haven't quite captured yet. So it's one that's worth definitely, it's not really good for short. It's not like 10 weeks of a project um, in this subject. It wouldn't be good enough to get it. You get at best 10 episodes out, probably realistically closer to eight and five wouldn't be bad. But it's one where I think we have a future that needs to be further explored. All right, the last bit, the theory and application. This arm of the process is, the key idea here is the notion of understanding behavior in an environment. Now I mentioned Cora, um, I've posted there. This paper has a really interesting notion of the social dynamics of leadership and followership. And that in Cora, knowledge sharing is an intrinsic motivation. As you might have noticed, I like to write about things. I like to share things. But that driver of intrinsic motivation of knowledge sharing is what gives me my initial spark to create. And then if you look at this in terms of co-creation of value, Forming words into sentences in, to relay ideas to other people to share my knowledge is the benefit I am gaining. The reciprocity on the exchange is when people gain from reading my work and let me know, leave good or something fic, or hire me to do a consultancy. So there is a whole bunch of stuff around trust, commitment, and reciprocity, relationship marketing, co-creation. This paper focuses on a specific attitudinal measure now for the context of what you're working on in terms of your review of the uh, e-taper, the technology performance review, a paper like this is a really good way to explore how an idea of why does someone do what they do. So have a look at this paper from that perspective of it is explaining how a behavior is it exhibited and motivated and supported through an environment. Not that far removed from what I'm asking you to do about yourself, to look back reflectively and say, why in marketing language am I doing what I'm doing with this platform? And with that, a bit of advice, you know where to find me if you need me. And we're having the heavy end of the semester showing up. So if you need me, reach out, get in contact, and with that, mates, we're done.